Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, all of my friends here in person and everyone who's joining us online. My name is Nigel Ball. I'm the executive director of the Government Outcomes Lab here at the Levatnik School of Government, Oxford University. This is the final session of our Social Outcomes Conference 2021. Um, and it is my great pleasure to be joined by two experts in a very hot topic at the moment, uh, which is the topic of responsible business. So I'm very much looking forward to exploring this topic uh, with our two guests um, and with all of you. Um, I'll start off by introducing our two guests. Um, I'll start by introducing Dr. Dambisa Moyo, who is joining us virtually. Welcome, Dambisa. For those of you that don't know, Dambisa, she is a global economist. She is a member of several corporate boards um, and has been a member of several others in the past over the last 10 years. She is an author, uh, very well known for her first book, I think it was your first book, Dambisa, Dead Aid. And more recently, this book, How Boards Work, which we will be drawing on quite a lot in today's session. Um, Dambisa was named in the list of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Um, has published in the Financial Times, WSJ, Barron's, Harvard Business Review, and has traveled to 65 countries. Um, and joining Dambisa, but in person, we're lucky enough to have you in person, Professor Karthik Ramana, who's the Professor of Business and Public Policy here at the Blavatnik School of Government. Um, Karthik is an expert on business government relations, sustainable capitalism, and corporate reporting and auditing. Um, he has studied how organizations build trust with stakeholders and the role of business in designing sensible and responsible rules of the game. And he's authored dozens of research articles and case studies on non-market strategies in Africa, China, the EU, India, the US, and has consulted with several leading business organizations worldwide, Fidelity, KPMG, McKinsey, PwC, Sonne, and State Street. So, as you can tell, we have two very, very highly qualified people to discuss this issue. I'm not sure we could wish for two more highly qualified people to discuss this issue, which is why I'm so excited about the, the session ahead. So, uh, Dambisa and Karthik, welcome. Thank you. So, responsible business, um, I said it's a, a hot topic. Um, it's an idea that has been around a long time, but has enjoyed much more prominence recently. And I think on the face of it, it does seem like an unequivocally good thing. Who wouldn't want corporations and businesses to act more responsibly and to act in the wide interests of society? Um, but as we are going to explore in this session, uh, the picture is perhaps slightly more complicated than that. So I'm going to start with you, Karthik, if I may. If you could just help to set the scene for our audience tonight and tell us a little bit about the history of responsible business, the journey that, that we've been on when it comes to responsible business over the last several decades and where we find ourselves today. Sure. Um, first off, huge thanks uh, for having me here. And I'm absolutely delighted to uh, share uh, this um, sort of virtual podium with Dembisa, whose book is um, a really excellent. Uh, it's a fantastic sort of insight into how boards work, as the title suggests. And so I highly recommend um, those of you who are interested in sort of getting into the mechanics of uh, corporate governance to pick that up. Um, so look, the story of responsible business since the end of World War II is um, effectively one of two eras. If you want to sort of draw a sharp line, I would say the uh, line is somewhere around 1980. Uh, though the uh, motivation for perhaps the shift happens in 1970 when a man called Milton Friedman writes uh, an a, a article in the New York Times magazine called The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Profits. And um, uh, up to that point, the, the sort of the conventional wisdom is that corporations uh, sort of exist in an ecosystem and they are... Um, sort of, you know, uh, responsible members of their communities. And what Friedman ushers in, of course, it's not just Friedman, there are many others. In fact, I'd say the person who does most of the intellectual uh, heavy lifting is a guy called Michael Jensen. Um, but um, what he and others do is basically set the stage for uh, what sociologists have since called the financialization of uh, the business sort of uh, uh, ecosystem, where the primary focus of business becomes uh, shareholder value maximization. Um, 
Now that's sort of the, 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 the scenario on the surface of it, but I think that that's a, perhaps a somewhat simplistic description of the situation in part because uh, business has always been about making money. I mean, Adam Smith writes about it, um, you know, 200 years before Milton Friedman. Uh, and of course, sort of the, uh, the very origins of human writing uh, is, uh, you know, we would love to think that humans decided to put things down on, um, you know, to commit thoughts to writing because of some wonderful poetry or something like that. But no, it wasn't. Uh, the, uh, the, the origins of human writing are basically accounting. Uh, and, and so we decide to start writing things down because we're worried about, you know, people we're doing business with uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, gaming the system and gaming us in the process. So, so, so this is a very age old idea that, that, you know, businesses uh, effectively are out to uh, look out for themselves. And, and of course, you know, in the history of industrial capitalism, which is more recent, uh, around the late 1800s, you have the era of the robber barons, and then you have sort of the progressive revolution that follows. And so, so um, in part, what Friedman is responding to and what Jensen are responding to and this sort of profound sort of shift in the nature of, uh, of sort of uh, capitalism that happens between the 70s, 80s, and early 90s is really um, uh, the sense that uh, in Friedman's sort of, uh, sort of uh, not necessarily his words, but in, in his sense that American corporations in particular had become fat and happy is the term that was used and that they were losing out uh, in a competitive way to Japan. So this was the time when Friedman was writing, everybody was worried uh, that Japan was going to take over the world and you know, industrial Japan. There was a time when uh, somewhat apocryphally, the real estate in downtown Tokyo was seemingly more valuable than all of the real estate in California. Uh, and so this was the moment when Friedman was writing that American industrial companies become so consumed with um, their sort of, you know, their responsibilities in society and so forth. They were so consumed with taking care of their labor, taking care of environment, taking care of all of these other things that they'd forgotten to make money for investors. And that's where their focus needed to be. Um, now, whether that's true or not, it was certainly a very compelling sort of, you know, um, ideology or rhetoric. And so people picked up on it. And, uh, and that's sort of um, what we've seen uh, in the last perhaps now 40 years, kind of period from 1980 to today. I would argue that one of the more profound shifts in the nature of um, responsible business or the nature of capitalism more generally um, over that period isn't so much a realization amongst corporations that they needed to make money, because I argue the corporations always wanted to make money. It's just sort of, you know, maybe there was some, um, you know, on second order change, shift in priorities. But um, but on a first order level, the, the, the really important shift is um, the norms around corporate engagement in uh, the political sphere. And up until the 1970s, um, certainly both the norm and the law, certainly in the context of the U.S., and a, a lot of what I'll say will be grounded in the U.S. because of the sort of disproportionate size of the U.S. economy uh, in the world, certainly at that time, um, the norm and the law in the U.S. was one of sort of uh, a pretty clear separation between um, uh, corporate uh, engagement in the political sphere and the in, and the engagement of individuals in businesses. So you know, there, so they, there was a distinction made between, for instance, the capacity of an individual businessman or woman to make uh, political contributions as uh, as they would as citizens, and um, the uh, rights and, and, and the citizenship of the corporation as a whole. But in the 1970s, there's sort of a big shift in that. And in fact, one of the first Supreme Court rulings that set the stage for what eventually becomes the Citizens United ruling in, in, in the early 2000s, or in 2010, I think is when Citizens United wow. happens, um, is, uh, is this recognition that corporations have some sort of personhood status and that corporations rather than the individuals in those corporations are in fact um, people with uh, voting rights, with not voting rights, but with political rights. So the right to lobby, the right to um, uh, basically have unrestricted contributions to the political sphere. So corporations become sort of very politically um, active citizens in the process. And that, 
um, that shift is actually, that happens at that time. And I'll give you one quote and then I'll stop so that we can hear um, uh, the second question perhaps from Dembisa. And um, there's a very interesting um, sort of, um, uh, there's a guy called Lewis Powell who goes on to become uh, a judge of the US Supreme Court. Um, and he becomes a judge in the late 1970s. But in 1971, um, he was not a judge of the U.S. Supreme Court. He was a lobbyist for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the um, Association for Business in America. And he was commissioned by the, Cong uh, by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to write a report about, you know, why is it that business is not as engaged politically as it should be? And this is, so I quote now from Powell, he says, business must learn the lesson that political power is necessary, that such power must be assiduously cultivated, and that when necessary, it must be used aggressively and with determination, without embarrassment and without reluctance, which has been so characteristic of American business to date. So, so this is, I mean, he writes this so explicitly. And then, of course, he goes on uh, in, in the late 1970s to write the first Supreme Court um, opinion that establishes a political speech right for corporations. And then since then, it's just effectively unraveled. Uh, and um, what's interesting about um, Powell's sort of vision for um, corporations, he, in fact, this is another of my favorite quotes. He says, um, the chamber should enjoy a particular rapport with increasingly influential graduate schools of business. Um, should not the chamber also request specific courses in such schools, dealing with the entire scope of the problem addressed by this memorandum. This is now essential training for executives of the future. So not only is Powell uh, establishing that there's a need for business to become involved with corporation, uh, with, with the political sphere, he's saying, and we should use business schools to teach the future business leaders that this is in fact the role of the corporation. And then when he goes on to write the, um, the opinion, the original Supreme Court opinion, what's interesting is that the uh, dissent comes from the conservative side of the court. Because today you would attribute the conservative side of the court as being sort of really sort of on board with this. But it is William Rehnquist who goes on to become chief justice. At the time, he's not chief justice. He's a junior judge in, or associate justice in the Supreme Court. And William Rehnquist writes, um, all, uh, in a dissent to the uh, Powell uh, ruling on this, establishing corporate personhood. Uh, although the court has never explicitly recognized a corporation's right of commercial speech, such a right might be considered necessarily incidental to the business of a commercial corporation. It cannot be so readily concluded that the right of political expression is equally necessary to carry out the functions of a corporation for organized commercial purpose. Can you imagine a conservative judge writing this today, right? So I would argue that business has always been making money, but the big thing that has shifted in the course of the last you know, 50, 70 years that you've asked for is that we've gone from a norm and a law where business basically was not a political actor to norms and laws where business basically has full political rights short of being able to vote in uh, elections. And to me, that's the most profound shift. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karthik. OK, so um, quite a provocative uh, opening statement there, um, because we know that businesses in America do use their, their political rights. Um, I didn't know that they, they had uh, received those political rights in that way. Um, I think the thing that many people in the audience may be aware of that's happened in the last couple of years is that businesses have started to make statements that seem to cut against this idea of shareholder primacy and shareholders being first and foremost. So the most well-known of these was the Business Roundtable in the United States, which is a group of 200 CEOs of leading companies in the United States. In 2019, came out and said, uh, basically, it's not about shareholder primacy anymore. Businesses exist to serve all stakeholders, their employees, their customers, and the communities that they work in. So, so this was a very influential group coming out with this statement, and it was followed by a similar statement um, in this country, in the United Kingdom. So businesses are starting to say something quite different now. Um, and uh, Dambisa, you sit on the board of many businesses, and you have done so for the last decade. So you've been on the inside um, sitting on boards who no doubt have been discussing some of the, these shifts um, 
uh, and perhaps uh, you can tell us a little bit about, is this a, a, a response to a demand from, uh, from customers, a response to a demand from society more broadly? Is this businesses recognizing that given government failure, they have a moral imperative to, to step in and do more for communities? How is this, how is this sort of felt to you uh, from, from the inside, if you like? Well, thank you so much for including me in this very interesting conversation. I, I'm delighted to be here. And, you know, Karthik, I, I really enjoyed your, and I, I'm having read um, a lot of what you've written, I've enjoyed that um, perspective in terms of what the impetus has been. I mean, I, I'm going to be a little bit um, a provocative, I think, in, in some respects here. Um, first of all, to, to say that I'm not entirely sure it's relevant or it matters what the impetus is. There, there, there might, might be a, a point for us to have a conversation about what's happening now, but the, you know, whether it's institutional shareholders, um, government inefficiency, which to, to my mind is a large piece of the story, um, or you know, customer demands chasing, changing uh, societal needs. Um, I, I think the, the first point I just want to stress is that um, it, you know, it, it, the, the proverbial horse has bolted um, and uh, it, it is what it is, um, whether we like it or not, um, uh, um, boardrooms and corporations are now expected to opine on a lot of the, uh, the social trends um, that are dominating, whether it's environmental concerns, um, diversity and social concerns around voting rights, uh, obesity, gun control, uh, data privacy, um, or uh, you know, whether it has, uh, it's being driven by employees or, or uh, institutional investors. So, it, it, you know, I, I'm sure I'll, I'll be speaking out of both, uh, both sides of my mouth on this bit, but, you know, fundamentally, I, I think it's kind of immaterial how we got here. The fact is that we're here. Um, having said that, and I should have said that there's about $53 trillion now uh, that is earmarked to ESG. Um, and if you, uh, like I, have spent a lot of time in the financial markets and you think about these uh, trends, um, you know, whether it was the nifty 50, 50s in the, in the 1950s, or you think about the BRICS, or you think about uh, tech, you know, technology, fangs, et cetera, there always seem to be themes uh, in, in the financial markets. Um, some are transitory, some are sticky. Um, right now, ESG is, is the thing. Um, frankly, I don't think it's going away anytime soon, but I think that that re basically uh, reveals um, a number of issues, which I'll touch on in a moment. So I have a few points that I just like to underscore, picking up on some of the things that Karthik um, mentioned. Um, first of all, I actually, um, I never did meet Milton Friedman, but I have to say overall, I feel like he's been treated very shabbily. Um, he has been basically uh, loaded with this sense that um, he, he had one view and one view only of corporations. And he's partly to blame for that, because if you do actually read um, his 1970 article in the New York Times, um, he did say that you know, corporations have that responsibility. However, in that same document, he gave us as board members and uh, you know, providers of oversight enough degrees of freedom to change direction um, and to reflect more generally um, societal imperatives. Um, I think that he was perhaps a little bit guilty of having too much faith in government. I mean, he was writing in 1970. There was a lot to be said for the development of Silicon Valley. Um, the fact that the United States government had been really quite active in, in terms of the development of the um, interstate network, um, high schools. I mean, there's there's a lot that government has been um, when, when it's performing at its very best. Um, and so in that regard, I think he did feel like there was a sort of ring fence delineation in terms of responsibilities of corporations versus uh, government. Um, you know, it is true to say that government has really underperformed. And in that respect, as a board member, I do worry a lot because because um, I, I'm not appointed by, uh, by voters. Um, yes, we have votes um, from shareholders, but I'm being asked to opine a lot of societal things. I mean, most recently around abortion and the Texas uh, issues that many of you will be familiar with, but voting rights, um, issues around race, uh, environment, as I mentioned earlier, obesity, gun control. I mean, I am neither equipped to do that, nor am I elected by uh, society writ large to, to opine on how we allocate resources on these uh, very important uh, sort of uh, backbone of society type of issues. But that's essentially what I'm being asked to do. 
Um, so in a, in a nutshell, I think uh, it's true that we have degrees of freedom. Um, and I think Milton Friedman left us with that uh, in there. So I, I, yeah, I feel like I should speak out for him um, and say that uh, yeah, I think he should have been treated a bit more, more fairly um, in, in sort of general uh, conversation. Um, I've touched on the second point I was going to make, which is that I do think government's getting a free pass here. We need governments that are data driven, that are forward leaning. Um, that focused on measured outcomes and, and are not corrupt. And what we're getting in, instead is a lot of short-termism, a lot of haphazard approaches, and we can talk about climate change specifically later, um, no guidance. Um, some governments are focused on, on the net zero. All of these are important inputs, but there's really very poor leadership, and this has been going on for several decades. And so what has happened is society has gotten frustrated um, and really have now left these issues at the doorstep of corporations. Um, corporations are struggling uh, to address these things. We're doing our best in terms of metrics um, and in terms of, of trying to make sure that we don't um, rush out and uh, you know, go ahead of where, where public policy may land, but also we, that we also take into consideration second order effects such as disorderly migration that might come about from uh, defunding uh, corporations as an example. A third thing that I, I worry about quite greatly is that there's an extensive literature about corporations that um, perform uh, over a long periods of time, you know, 30 years, uh, you know, multiple decades, companies that outperform stock markets and outperform their peers are companies where the CEO is very doggedly focused on capital allocation. Um, they are, um, you know, there's a wonderful book by called The Outsiders by William Thorndike, in which he talks explicitly about how the, you have this one guy or gal at the helm who is wakes up every morning and says, what do I do with this marginal dollar or pound in terms of investment so that the companies can be going concerns. We need these companies to function. They're a basis of a tax base. They provide jobs. They are the source of innovation um, and work best alongside partnerships with government. So we've got to, we've got to do this. Um, in, the, in the United States, just to give you some uh, some uh, some metrics here. Um, the largest Fortune 500 companies represent two thirds of American uh, their revenues. Just their revenues, uh, annual revenues, represent two thirds of U.S. GDP. That's enormous. Um, and, and, and you know we've seen you know basically live what corporations can do when they are supported by government, working in partnership in government in terms of the vaccine, which was rolled out in, in record time. Um, so just a few other points, and maybe this is more telegraphing to the future. Um, as, I, as I intimated a moment ago, one of my great concerns is that it might be all well and good at, the, at this particular moment to say we need corporations to do more, um, but I can't be sure that it won't be too long before people will start asking the question, why is Dambisa Moyo opining on voter rights? Um, you know, I never elected her. And, and I, I, I worry very much that that world is coming uh, quite fast and furious. Why do I think that's going to happen more aggressively? Two fundamental and structural changes that are occurring right now that we're all witnessing. One is digitization and technology um, that is going to replace workers. So I worry a lot, there's a lot of conversation about minimum wage, very important, and we should think about that. And corporations are being again asked to, to and boards asked to talk about uh, where we stand on that. But at the same time, uh, very little, you know, talking about what the, 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 the sort of advent or the, the sort of significant in, increase in technological uh, automation robotics is going to do um, to workers and, and how we should be solving for that, the problem, the proverbial problem of where the puck is going, not where it is today. Uh, I don't hear much on that, but I, people are expecting uh, corporations and boards to deal with that. Another quick point, another trend is a lot of corporations frustrated by the lack of leadership, frustrated by the lack of action um, from the policymakers and the regulatory environment um, are, are deciding to go private. So in the United States over the last 10, 15 years, they've gone from about 7,500 companies that are publicly listed down to 3,000, down by about 50%. Um, the room where it happens, so to speak, is now um, somewhere else. So we're spending time basically running these large public corporations out of town, but um, there's a bigger discussion to be had about what decisions and what choices um, co companies and organizations that are private are making. Um, there's no scope for that because again, there's a lot of, of, of shouting and pointing fingers, very little community discussion around corporations. 
Um, what are the costs? I'll, I'll end up here. Uh, one of the big costs that I see and I worry about a lot is not just this delisting into private companies, but also the fact that companies are now choosing to pay more dividends and share buybacks um, and, re and re basically reducing their reinvestment. Um, and just a few years ago, the dividend um, to retained earnings, retained earnings really being the source of investment for future growth. Um, has gone down, uh, it was, excuse me, the, that ratio dividends to uh, retained earnings was, uh, was over 100% for virtually every sector in the United States. Um, and, and that to me says that corporations and boards are more and more concerned about there not being opportunities um, to invest in society um, for the future. And they're basically saying, we're gonna take this capital out and, um, and hand it back to, to financial shareholders. I think we'll see a lot more of that. And uh, we've already seen the concentration of, uh, of corporations in different sectors. Again, I think where, the, where capitalism has failed us, globalization has been challenging. I think that is falls to my mind squarely at the feet of, of uh, regulators and public policy. Um, and I don't know why it is that we have allowed that as society writ large and we're not demanding uh, much more action. Um, I think there is scope for better corporations but to the notion that we should lay all these social concerns at the feet of, of corporations, um, to my mind, is, is, is a deep problem. Uh, so I'll stop there. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nambisa. Um, I think it's a very interesting and quite provocative viewpoint, because I think what you're saying is that corporations don't or shouldn't necessarily welcome this shift, you know, wherever it's coming from. It's not actually necessarily wanted. And you point to a quite... Um, quite scary risk in some ways, you know, which is that this dystopian future that's much represented in fiction where you have giant mega corporations basically controlling society, you know, you, you paint a picture where it feels like we could end up on that path if we're not already on it. Um, so that's, you know, that's a stark warning actually um, and, and should all give us pause about whether this shift back to responsible business is, is really something we should welcome. But Karthik, I'll, I'll bring you back in here because I know you've thought quite a lot about the, you. you know, how citizens and, and consumers um, uh, engage with, with corporations and, and what some of those risks are and how they might be avoided. So please tell us a little bit more about some of your work. Um, so I agree uh, uh, with a lot of what Dambisa said in that um, on the following headline points. One, um, it's uh, largely a failure of government. I would also add it's a failure of civil society. Um, and two, it is uh, an extremely dangerous thing for corporations to be filling that void. Um, dangerous to liberal democracy, uh, not just to corporate boards. I mean, indeed, it's dangerous to corporate board members too, because they will, as Dembisa said, one day, the, you know, people will turn around and storm the Bastille. Uh, and then, you know, you find yourself sort of on the wrong side of that. But I think it's even more dangerous to liberal democracy. So, so that's what I'm worried about. Um, but, um, uh, you know, one of the most powerful uh, sort of conceptions in uh, the modern liberal democratic state is the notion of separation of powers, right? So within a, a, a government, you have an executive, a legislative, legislative branch, and you have a judicial branch. And that's um, the idea is that through those checks and balances and through that sort of distribution of roles, um, you are constantly uh, have you know one side keeping track of the other and so forth. And, and that's really worked very, very well uh, in terms of sustaining uh, governments, particularly liberal, liberal democratic governments, from sort of, you know, becoming drunk with power. And I think in some sense that metaphor of separation of powers is something that's very useful to think about sort of um, uh, at a trisectoral level as well, which is the separation of powers between government, between business, and between civil society. And I think each of these sort of roughly three sort of sectors or, or um, uh, uh, institutions within sort of our modern society have different roles to play. And the role of business is to make money. And that is a good and useful thing. And I don't think there's anything wrong with Milton Friedman. And like Dambisa, I think he's sort of often maligned and so forth because he's, um, you know, emphasizing the point that it's a good and useful thing for business to make money. That's what they were set up to do, make money. 
Um, now, how they make money is, of course, a, a, a question of strategy. And um, as economists, we would say it is a dynamic uh, uh, optimization problem. So it's not a static optimization problem, but a dynamic optimization problem. And what that means is that in one period, you might say, I make money by selling you know, products that are sort of the lowest cost products. In another period, I'll say, well, actually, the tastes of my consumers have changed, and I don't want to just emphasize low cost. I want to emphasize the quality of labor, and I want to emphasize the uh, environmental impact and so forth. And so it's a dynamic problem, and it's a question of strategy of how you make money. But as consumer tastes change, as investor preferences change, as um, you know, regulations change, businesses find different ways to, uh, or different approaches to make money. But at the end of the day, their job is to make money. Um, their job is not to fill in the void of government. And like Dambisa, I'm worried that government has underperformed, particularly government in sort of, you know, liberal democratic states like the U.S. and the U.K. have underperformed. And so with the sort of the power of business and the success of business, there's a temptation to go to the one institution in society um, that is doing really well and say, oh, why don't you help us solve all these problems? Um, but that's really, really dangerous. It's like saying when you know, the executive branch in government is failing to go to the judicial branch and say, why don't you take over the, the role of the executive? You would never think to do that. That would be a profoundly stupid thing to do within government. And, and so in the same way, it, you know, thinking that responsible business will solve the woes that we have in society is a profoundly dangerous idea. Um, this doesn't mean that businesses aren't responsible. There are plenty of businesses that are really responsible, many of whom Dambisa has cataloged in the book and many of whom I've worked with, et cetera, and I have great respect for them. And I, but at the end of the day, I would not build public policy around the idea that all businesses will be responsible all the time. That seems like a profoundly dangerous thing to do. And that's really where I sort of, sort of um, drive the needle. And that's why I'm, I'm sort of deeply skeptical of responsible business. You spoke about the business roundtable um, sort of corporate purpose statement. There's a friend of mine called Lucian Bebchuk, who is a professor at Harvard Law School, who did an analysis of those companies that signed um, the, the statement. And, and he's a sort of professor of corporate governance um, and, and corporate law. So for instance, he's an expert on you know, the, the law that governs how boards work. And he pointed out that not a single one of those CEOs who signed that statement um, actually consulted their board on the matter that they were signing that statement. And he said, you can infer two things from that. Number one, that they violated the basic principle of corporate governance, or number two, that they weren't serious about what they were saying when they signed that statement. And he says, look, they have lots of really smart lawyers, including people like me. And they were not stupid when they didn't consult their board. They're just not serious about it. And then there's lots of great evidence about, you know, the, the, basically the, there's a whole sort of sub-industry that has come out in academia about those companies that signed that corporate purpose statement. And now everybody and their cousin is writing a paper about, um, you know, how those companies are not serious about the statement. Um, there's another great paper that came out just um, uh, this week um, by uh, Marion Bertrand at the University of Chicago and several other co-authors. Um, which looks at the relationship between civil society and, and business. And again, this goes back, the reason I mentioned it, it goes back to the notion of se separation of powers. And there's some brilliant anecdotes in there about how um, you know, utility companies were making donations to the NAACP, which is the National Association for Advancement of Colored People in the US, which is one of the primary uh, uh, um, organizations that, uh, um, that advocate for minority rights in the US and, um, and were making donations to the NAACP. And in return, the NAACP was submitting comment letters to regulators on those utility companies' positions. And in fact, she points that the, the evidence, she and her co-authors uh, in that paper point to evidence that suggests in periods where uh, there's an alignment in donations between the corporations and civil society organizations, and there are many, not just the NAACP, that's just a headline example she uses. Um, in that alignment period, there is a 76% increase in the likelihood that that particular um, uh, civil society organization will lobby on behalf of the corporation. Although it might be on an in issue that is completely outside of the uh, civil society organization's interest. So for instance, why would the NAACP write to utilities regulators about the nature of industrial regulation of utilities 
in a particular state. That is so far outside the remit of the NAACP. Well, it turns out because in that particular case, they got a $250,000 check from the local regulator. So it's this notion of sort of, you know, that that's where the separation of powers becomes sort of, if you dissolve that separation of powers, it becomes a deeply, deeply corrupting influence in society. That's what I'm worried about. Not the fact that there aren't responsible businesses. There are a few, and there are plenty actually. Don't build policy around it, is what I say. Thanks, Karthik. So it seems to me that this comes down to uh, a failure of, of, of public accountability for corporations. Now, you know, corporations aren't publicly accountable in the same way as, as governments, but as you both eloquently pointed out, uh, it's the role of governments and civil society to, to regulate business and hold business to account. Um, and, you know, you, it's really interesting, Karthik, as well, to hear you talk about the business roundtable statement and uh, slightly challenge the veracity of that statement. Um, you know, and, of course, you're not the only one to have done so, but that also points to a risk, which is that companies are saying things that they know will resonate with their consumers to make more money, um, but these statements are hollow, and, and government and civil society are not holding them to account. In fact, they're welcoming it. They want corporations to say this because then corporations step into the role that they perhaps uh, should be playing. So, um, so this seems to add an additional kind of layer of risk, and I want to come back to you, Dan Bisa, just to talk a bit about that, and then, then we'll go to some questions. I know there's some Things coming through on the chat here as well, which will we'll leave some time to pick up towards the end. But I just want to come back to you, Dan Bisa, because um, you know we, we know there's uh, you know we, we're agreed at least on the panel here. There's a failure of government. It seems to be a failure of civil society as well. Corporations, it seems, can kind of get away with saying what they want. Does that add to the risks? Is that is that uh, should we blame the corporations for that, or should we blame government and civil society for buying it? and all of us for buying the message that's being sort of sold? Well, I think that uh, one of the fundamental um, schisms that's, that has kind of become more front of mind um, is the fact that um, corporations by their nature actually are long-term in terms of how they should be thinking. I'm, I'm not saying that they do it well. Um, we know about quarterly earnings and some of the stuff we talked about, about dividends versus retained earnings really underscores the fact that there's a failure in that. But I will tell you that we make every effort, um, whether it's extending compensation, thinking about rewards um, and, and also penalization, things like malice and clawback on comp as an example, but also recruitment, we have a responsibility to think long term, and that's essentially how traditionally companies have been that had been judged um, until um, really, I would argue, um, there was uh, the, the sort of rise of debt, um, fiat money. Uh, I would, you know, maybe it goes as far back, and Karthik will have a view of you know when of when the United States became the reserve currency was delinked from the dollar uh, from the from gold in the 1970s. That uh, ma meant governments. Um, themselves became quite careless in how they think about using money. Um, the debt burden we know, not just because of COVID, but obviously exacerbated through COVID is now over 100% debt to GDP ratio. There was a lot of, of that kind of behavior, which also seeped into the private sector. Um, in the United States, um, for example, today, 14% of companies are zombies. That means they don't even generate enough cash flow to cover the interest payment on their debt. Um, that kind of a system, and we haven't even talked about private sector, but all of that has sort of fed into um, what I would say is, uh, is the erosion of this long-term capital future investing kind of psychology. Um, so, but bear with me for a moment, really corporations are, are trying really hard and traditionally have taken the longer view, um, you know, thinking about uh, you know, investments uh, through the cycle, et cetera. Uh, government, has really been rewarded, particularly democratic governments. They are rewarded as policymakers for short-term behavior. Um, they are in office in the United States uh, here, you know, five years uh, max for prime minister. But uh, if you think about the US, they have elections every two years. Um, there has been, been built in a culture of making statements and proclamations that really can't hold water um, over the long term. Uh, you know, one of my one the one one of the things I think is quite interesting, more just as a recent example, um, you know, President Biden and, and the, the, the American administ new American administration came in on a very uh, aggressive climate change agenda. Um, very, uh, you know, I shut down the Keystone. Uh, they basically have been very aggressive about fossil fuels. 
and yet it's now reported that uh, you know when, when, with uh, uh, energy at the pump, as they say in the U.S., at uh, nearly five dollars in some place, five five dollars a gallon. Um, we've seen President uh, Biden calling the Saudis and the Russians, asking them to 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 pump more more energy. Um, you know, it's those times. And by the way, I, I'm a pragmatist, so I probably would have done the same. But I'm just saying that there's there's no commitment. It feels to me. Um, from public policy to think about long term, um, you know, I, I'll give you a very another quick example, and this is very hairy. I'm sure I'm going to get condemned from this, but you know, Afghanistan has one of the largest lithium deposits in the world. Uh, we've just seen the West completely pull out. You know, I, I don't know. I have to believe and hope that there was a conversation about what the strategic consequences for battery usage, replacing fossil fuels, thinking about future energy sources. I have to believe somebody somewhere asked that question, but I'm just looking at the outcomes. We now have China and Russia running, rushing in. We're gonna need lithium at this point in time. Maybe there will be innovation to the contrary, but what I'm essentially saying is that there's a schism that's emerged. We're trying to think long-term about job creation, about digitization, about the risks to business, opportunities for business. And at the same time, you have public policy that is really making short-term decisions that are proving quite costly. So to me, that is the biggest delta that we need, we're trying to manage. Um, I don't know how you, you solve that. Um, places like China, uh, for better or for worse, um, have a different model. Um, you, we've seen, you know, just, just in the tech space, government has committed to common prosperity. They have many more degrees of freedom um, to, to force corporations to think long term. Um, you know, I, I worry, as I've already intimated greatly um, about, you know, really the efficacy of what corporations can do. In, in, uh, in, in the West, um, especially not just because of how we operate in Western society, but how are we going to compete with global ju juggernauts um, who are um, perhaps, you know, in the extreme cases, deprioritizing uh, ESG, um, but in the, in the less extreme case are being subsidized or helped by government in a much more active long-term way um, as, as you know, I would argue that, that China is doing, uh, whereas corporations are being left to, to sort of handle it on their own. So I think there are lots of hairy issues here. I don't have answers for all of them, but I will tell you that I think that there's more pain to be felt um, uh, in terms of, uh, of the evolution, because I don't know where these discussions are being held in, in a sort of sensible um, calm way. Um, you know, I happen to serve on the Oxford University's investment committee um, the decision was essentially made that we're not going to invest in fossil fuels. Um, it's completely antithetical. As, as somebody who studied at Oxford many years ago, to my mind, completely antithetical uh, and goes against um, the, uh, how, on the other hand, we say we want to have more diversity in the student body. I mean, where do you think those students are coming from? You know, you don't expect African, Asian, and South American students to come to Oxford if, you're, if you, they don't have access to energy at home. So for them to read and study and, and be able to, to attend Oxford. But those conversations are, are highly delinked. Um, there is a lot of here and now uh, really driving for the short-term solutions and actions. And, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I do my best. Um, I, I try to be um, constructive, but I, I do worry a lot that there's a lot of let's just solve it for now. And, you know, if there, if there are costs or deadweight losses, somebody in the future will, will pick them up. Wow. OK, thank you, Dambisa. <laughs> yeah. Um, Did I say something controversial? <laughs> no, no, I think you've just got us all thinking um, and it's, a, a, you know, it's a. It's quite a scary picture, to be honest, I think, that, that you, well, you paint. Here, you know, the risks are on, on many may, sides. If I may, just, just again, I'm, because I, I grew up in, in, uh, as an economist, I'm very numbers focused. But we have 1.5 billion people on the planet right now who've got no access to energy. Um, and I'm picking energy. By the way, Karthik, you made a very good point. Um, you know, when people think of ESG, they think E. So I'm not surprised that the, the CEOs didn't call the, the board for, because that's a governance point. Nobody really deals with S or G. We're left to our own devices. How companies deal with that is their problem. The E is, is very sexy. It's very modern. Everybody wants to, everybody opines. I mean, if you just Google climate change, there everybody has an opinion. Uh, you know, people who have deep knowledge in the space and people who don't. But 
what we have to really think about the, the, the knock on effects in society, the second order consequences. Um, and I'm picking on E because that's the, that's the, the big thing right now, but really the, around the question of the role of corporations is there are second order effects that have meaningful consequence for society. Um, defunding corporations, uh, whether you're Oxford University Endowment or whomever, many endowments have done that, um, is taking away the in incentive or the existential challenge that an energy company has to try and solve for this problem. Um, what does that mean? It means you have disorderly migration. Don't complain when you have people coming over to Dover in a boat when they are running away from the collapse economically and, and politically in their societies and looking for better opportunities. To my mind, those things are linked. We're not investing in these countries, we're not investing in these regions. We should be doing much more thinking in a more reasonable way. Um, but that is being you know, basically ceded to, to the private sector. So, I mean, I could go on and on. I, I'm not at all a Luddite. I'm not saying climate change doesn't exist. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do better, but I'm saying that there's not a place where there's, a, to my mind, um, and I've been to many conferences, I've been to many pu public policy spaces, there's not a place where these different power pools, the civil society, government, and private sector can come together and have a sensible conversation about risks and opportunities. Um, you know, and, and that to me is very problematic. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to go to the, to the room now for questions. And then uh, after that, we'll come to some questions in the chat. Um, so uh, hands in the room, I think. Keith, yeah, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, yes, uh, thank you. You yeah, have quite interesting uh, views. Uh, but, but, but Keith calls is my name. I'm a professor of corporate finance and governance at Tilburg University in the Netherlands, but my main career was in strategy consulting, having been a, a partner at, at the Boston Consulting Group and later on with PwC. So I know also the board's boardrooms from inside. What we, what we are hearing now, in my view, is extremely disturbing because, Professor Romana, what you're saying is we have the capitalist system is, is not is not a responsible system because you cannot expect corporations not to focus on money. They are there to make money and indeed they will never make decisions at the cost of shareholders. So we have the, where the money comes from, these, these entities are not, don't, don't have a really, a, 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 are not really societally responsible. And indeed, uh, I know the work of Bevchuk, et cetera, this, this famous statement from the Business Roundtable, yeah, it was it was hypocrisy. That's what you, you said. I did analysis also. So that's there. They they have shown again that they just go for the money. On the other hand, we don't we, we not only live in a capitalist system, but also in a democracy. And Dr. Moyo, you are saying also our political system, our democracy, is failing us because it's short term. And it's not yet at the long term because there are elections every four years or whatever. So both both uh, building blocks of our society, the capitalist system, is not responsible. So so society, the public, so the politicians should should um, should solve the problems, and they cannot. They do not because they also have they have this short term view. So what's what's the solution? <laughs> Uh, because you haven't the, talked about, both of you, you have not talked about solutions yet. Yeah, okay. So the, it's a nice summary of where we're up to in the discussion. And this is a plea, I think, for some optimism amid quite a bleak picture. So are either of you able to offer us some optimism? Well, I'm a very optimistic person. I mean, people who uh, who sort of know me know that I'm... I'm so I actually, look, I, 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 I agree that uh, you know, government hasn't done its job, and I um, I don't think it's a bad thing that corporations make money. I think that's why they exist. So you know, let them make money. And um, now, how do how do we fix that? Well, I mean, part of the reason why I uh, I used to teach in a business school, and now I teach in a school of government, is because I said, well, here's where the action is. If if the problem is you know fixing government, let me move to a school of government. Let me teach in a school of government instead, because there's plenty of people teaching businesses how to make money, and they're doing a really good job at it. Great, let them. So, okay, how do we fix the problem? Look, um, I, I, I appreciate that there are some dimensions on which, you know, we might look at a country like China and say, um, 
you know, they, they think long term and they're doing things that are in the sort of great greater uh, interest of the long term sort of benefit of their society and so forth. And yes, I mean, certainly you can't deny that. I mean, you know, the Communist Party, for all of my criticisms of it, has lifted more people out of poverty than any institution in human history. So it's a remarkable achievement. Uh, that said, I mean, you know, um, at the end of the day, what I like about liberal democracy is that there isn't one person in charge telling us what to do. And it's that, you know, every four years we can throw the people out. And sometimes they're, they're quite ridiculous. And so we do throw them out. And, and that's fine. That's, that, that's part of the, the, the process through which we uh, sort of, you know, iterate through these solutions. So, you know, uh, for instance, these ESG reports that we've been talking about, they're full of moral contradictions, right? So, for instance, there are reports where uh, companies claim that they have uh, eliminated, uh, you know, so I recently read a report of a mining company that claimed that it had eliminated uh, greenhouse gas emissions by dump trucks in the mines. And the way they had done this is, of course, to shift to using battery-powered dump trucks instead of fossil fuel-based dump trucks. But, of course, those battery-powered dump trucks were using um, batteries that were mined in places with indentured labor. So they got rid of one problem, which is the E problem, and they introduced another problem, which is the S problem. So there are all of these sort of social trade-offs there. And the, the reason I raise that is because, look, there is no real correct answer here for how you navigate that. And I don't want, you know... Chairman Xi telling us what the correct answer is. I'd rather we figure it out every four years. So we sort of muddle our way through it. And, and I'm not that pessimistic about that system. I mean, I do worry about corruption. And you know, one of the things that we emphasize tremendously here in the MPP, in the Oxford Master Public Policy, is uh, you know, about the value of integrity and in leadership and the kind of spirit that it takes to be in public leadership. Um, and how important it is to support each other through sort of the hard normative decisions that you have to make when you're in those public roles. But um, by and large, I remain very optimistic. I mean, there is no country in the world I would go long on more than America. Uh, and in that same way, uh, there is, uh, you know, I mean, outside of America, there is no country in the world I would go long on more than Britain. Because at the end of the day, I sort of, you know, have great faith in the inherent common sense of people. And in particular, their common sense not to believe in one savior leader um, to sort of solve all their problems. Because quite frankly, nobody has the answers. So I agree with Dembisa that there are lots of problems, and, but I'm, you know, I remain optimistic. One final point, Dembisa. So I sit on the investment committee of uh, St. John's College, uh, which, as you know, is a constituent college of Oxford. And we do not invest in Oxford University Endowment. We manage our own endowment. Big mistake. And Big mistake. We're making massive <laughs> returns. Got to come and invest. And well, we have not divested from fossil fuel, but let me put it that way. So we recognize that there are, it is absurd to think of some industries as uh, sin industries and other industries as non-sin industries. As, you know, and when, I, when you sit on these investment committees, as Dembisa knows, you get routinely pitched by asset managers peddling all these ESG products. Much of it is just nonsense. And, and, you know, so when you start peeling it, well, look, the big oil companies would not exist at this scale and scope if it weren't for the fact that we were all buying their products. So simply divesting of that is not a sensible way to solve the problem. Uh, there are sensible ways to solve the problem, but divestment is not. And so I think that it's important that, you know, for those of us who are in these sort of trustee positions, we hold the ground. We've had, I've taken enormous flack personally for that decision because the students protested, they camped out on the lawn and, and this and that. And, but at the end of the day, we have an intergenerational responsibility here. And there's no way in which we can say that, you know, we will divest off those companies and still produce the scholarship returns that we need in order to fund those student, the next generation of students to come there. So there are some hard moral choices to be made uh, at enormous personal cost to leaders making those choices. Um, leaders will make mistakes. I certainly make lots of mistakes every day. Uh, and, but, but that's just the nature of the problem. And I don't see reason to be completely pessimistic about that either. Thank you, Kathy. I, I, I will just quickly, if I may, give two, uh, two specific things that I think could be done. Um, and I too, um, I, I feel I'm optimistic. I do believe that uh, there's a chance for the world to be better than worse in years to come. Um, I think on the, um, uh, on the government side, I, I do think we should hope and really push for 
more innovation in public policy. And in my um, previous book to the, the not, not the, um, excuse me, not uh, how boards work, but the previous book before that edge of chaos, I give 10 specific things that governments can do. Um, I won't go through them here, but suffice it to say, they are very specific. Um, and many of them are actually, in fact, all of them uh, are already in place uh, in, in real world. So things like extending terms, things like uh, one term polit in political office instead of repeat. Um, so you, you know, in other words, you're trying to make sure that governments um, uh, um, do the best in the time that they have allotted and they're not trying to win the next election. Um, there are also some things around uh, taking the Singaporean model, which I think is very clever. Um, um, uh, secretaries of state or ministers actually get paid a bonus at the end of the year based on certain outcomes in their particular area. So if life expectancy is extended or the uh, infant mortality uh, rates are improved, um, then you actually get more, uh, you know, you get a higher bonus and there's, it's, it's almost like private sector malice and clawback. Anyway, the point of the matter is that that gave 10, and if you can't be bothered to read the whole book, is my publisher says, you don't have to read it, you just have to buy it. There's a chart, <laughs> back. Uh, there's actually a chart at the back um, that summarizes some of the things where, again, very specific, we can make progress. Um, on the public, on the private sector side with corporations, that where I think there's a lot of value is imbuing corporate discussions, boardroom discussions, again, with thinking about upside opportunity and not just focusing on risk mitigation to the downside. We have been very good now. We've become very good at uh, you know, thinking about the world as being half empty. Um, and so we think about being you know, this deconstructive world. We don't think about investments. We think about, I'll give climate change as an example, always really pushing for, uh, it seems to me, focus on greenhouse gas emissions, net zero, uh, you know, water intensity, all very crucial, but that's not in necessarily increasing the pie. There are some opportunities and some returns, but to me, I want to hear about solar, wind, water, gen, you know, nuclear gen four. I want to see how we can actually create jobs and opportunities thinking about the, the, the upside, EV, et cetera. So I think that's a specific area where there's a lot more work to be done. Um, and Karthik, I'll end by saying, um, let me guess, the people who were picketing outside St. John's uh, were tweeting on social media using their mobile phones, which they had charged using electricity, which is being run by fossil fuels. Isn't that interesting? And even that, as, crit <laughs> as critical as they are of, of the current energy system, I wish they would devote much more energy to find helping us find a solution to the climate problem. All right, thank you. Um, so I, I did promise I would come to some questions on Zoom, but unfortunately um, we have run out of time. So I'm glad, Karthik, you gave me a pass as a leader to make mistakes um, and break promises because that's what I'm gonna have to do. So apologies to those of you that joined online that we didn't get to directly address any of your questions, but I know there has been a spirited exchange on the chat. So thank you all. Thank you all for contributing to that. Um, all that really remains for me to say then, I think, is thank you very much to Karthik and Dambisa. I wish we could have gone on longer because there is so much that we have not explored on this topic, but you have certainly given us all uh, a lot of interesting provocations to think about and take forward. If I can just do a plug, uh, the next, uh, the lead article of the next issue of the Harvard Business Review will be an article that I've written on climate change accounting. It's a very, very technical article. However, it builds a new carbon accounting system. So uh, if you're really interested, so it's not like I'm not trying to find solutions to climate change. I'm very interested in it, but I think they have to be sensible solutions. So I, I encourage those of you who want me to divest of fossil fuels to read the article about how it is I would solve that problem as a, a regulator as well as an investment manager. So and, that's, and, that's, and, and, and yeah. since Karthik has had a, a word, I'd like to balance out the gender thing here and also offer a perspective. Um, as many of you will know, the United Kingdom is responsible for the G7 this year. Um, we are coming out of COVID, God willing. We are post-Brexit. Um, and there are two things that are happening this autumn that I think you, I hope people will be engaged with. Um, one is a, is a global investment summit. It's on the government website, 100% focused on build better on the green space. So the investment 
theme that I talked about earlier, really putting money to work to help society transition. Um, and of course, that will be closely followed in November by COP26, which I think, again, will continue to light fire under corporations and boards, um, particularly from a policy angle on trying to, to make sure that there's not just climate change concerns, but also climate action, um, that where we can actually bring um, everyone in the world uh, along to, to address this very crucial and urgent uh, challenge. So that's that. Brilliant. Thank you. And I will also, on Ambisa's behalf, plug her latest book, because it is great, and she's a wonderful Thank writer. You. So, great. Thank you both very much indeed, if we can offer a hand.